Hello, and welcome to yet another very special uh, Game Maker's Notebook. Uh, I am Robin Hunnicky, your esteemed host, who is not Ted Price. Ted Price is still not Spider-Man, but still on the road representing his new game. And so I'm here at Dice Europe in Cannes in France, um, just hanging out with developers, talking about the games industry and thinking about all the things that game designers and game developers think about. And I have the pleasure today of speaking with Mike Bithell, who I don't know that well. I didn't really know him that well before this episode, which might seem strange because I think we come across as having known each other for a long time. We had a fantastic conversation about many interesting aspects of game development and specific thinking about culture, the way that uh, games get made by teams, and transitioning from being an individual contributor or a young game developer into a more mature developer, a leader, and hopefully eventually a CEO and a lead designer. So really interesting conversation, um, heartfelt, honest, and also quite funny because Mike is, very, is a very funny guy. So I hope you enjoy this episode and thank you so much again for listening. Welcome to The Game Maker's Notebook, a podcast featuring a series of in-depth one-on-one conversations between game makers providing a thoughtful, intimate perspective on the business and craft of interactive entertainment. The Game Maker's Notebook is presented by the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences, a member-driven organization dedicated to the recognition and advancement of interactive entertainment. who is here at DICE Europe in lovely, beautiful, out, amazing, outrageous Cannes. Uh, it, that's in France, in case you didn't know. Um, and we're here to talk about game stuff and design stuff, because that's what we do. Mm. Um, and instead of embarrassing him with a long intro, I'm going to let Mike introduce himself. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello. I like that. I like that. That was a good. Um, yes, I'm also at Khan. I'm trying not to say it in the, the in wrath the of Khan voice. <laughs> no, I, I like the, uh, I like, yeah, Seti Alpha, whichever one it was. Um, so, yes, I'm Mike. Uh, I know too much about Star Trek movies, apparently. Uh, and I made uh, Thomas Was Alone, I guess is the thing that kind of I'm best known for, which was this rectangle based friendship driven platformer. <laughs> Uh, which, which just a very strange game. Um, <laughs> before that, I worked uh, in kind of traditional game dev. So I worked on a lot of kind of licensed games, children's games, that kind of thing. Um, and then since Thomas was alone, I, I've, I've built a studio team, a remote team. Uh, we made uh, Volume, which was a stealth game, which was kind of my, my childhood dream to make a Metal Gear Solid game. Um, then we worked with Google for a little while on some of their VR stuff and then, uh, made subsurface circular and quarantine circular recently, which were these kind of short narrative experiments. Yeah. Um, and now we're doing something much bigger and cooler, but completely secret. Oh, cool. Yes. All right. Let's get, let's get the, let's get right to that. Well, I'm glad to announce it here. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I have done a lot of press tours and I will not do that to you. Oh, that's very um, kind. I You're do, very kind. I do really, I really, when I was like thinking about like, what, what are the questions that I should ask? I, I did a poll this morning of some of the other developers here and I said, what are the worst questions that you get asked? And the very first one was, what are you working on now? And when does it come out? <laughs> Cause we all, we always get to ask that. Right. Um, mm. but one of the questions that we don't get asked is, um, how does it feel to follow up something? What is it like to have made something that was kind of out of the box mm. and a success and then follow it up? Like that's the thing that nobody really wants to ask you about because they're afraid the answer is going to be it's shit. It was awful. Difficult it was second difficult, album, the right? difficult second album. But mm. like, like what was it like to, to take the leap and build a studio and then follow that up, you know? Um, it was, I, I think it was, it was a, a confluence of things. I think, and, and I'm, I'm sure this is, well, just judging from things I see on Twitter, it seems like it's yeah. a pretty common path, but I, uh, from a professional perspective, it was the, the best period. You know, I, I had, after Thomas was alone, um, I got lots of calls. I got lots of, of access to, to people and opportunities. Um, and therefore that was why, you know, I made volume and, and just kind of made something that was very much like a dream project, um, on a professional level three and a half of the best years of my life. We made something that I'm, I'm proud of, that we worked with a good team on and, and had a great time. Personally, yeah. you know, absolutely overworked, burned out, did the whole thing. Um, and, you know, I don't I don't talk about it too much because I think, I, I don't know, I, it's, 
you know, my 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 career's gone so brilliantly that I occasionally yeah, get tired. It's a complain. hard thing to complain about. Yeah, like it's like yeah. it's you know you, you want to not not to dismiss anyone who 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 has got the the guts to share those stories. But for me, I've always kind of edged away from that. But like yeah, I I you know I was. I, you know, my girlfriend drove me to hospital one night because I just wow. was, I was getting like heart, heart palpitations because I just not rested for yeah. months on end. Um, so, so yeah, it was, uh, it was an experience, but, but, you know, you learn lessons from that as well. You know, you learn, you learn not to, not to let yourself do that. And then you obviously repeat those mistakes throughout your life because <laughs> that's what life is. Um, but yeah, so it was, it was, it was challenging. It was an amazing opportunity. I think, I think I went into it kind of with my eyes open in terms of what the reception would be. Okay. Um, because, um, because I had shipped lots of games and because I had, um, a lot of friends and colleagues in the industry who'd already shipped this difficult second album. And in a lot of cases that, that hadn't gone as well as they'd hoped. So I think I knew that, you know, Thomas was alone with something special and it was a game that, you know, maybe I get to make two or three of those in a career. Yeah. Um, so my expectation wasn't that, you know, every game would build on everything that went before it. Uh, volume was well received, but it wasn't, it didn't, it didn't, it wasn't earth shattering the way that Thomas was alone was. Right. Um, and uh, I was glad to be prepared for that. You know, that was an expectation because I, I think that's, I've, there's lots of stories of devs who I think um, have gone in assuming, oh, I made one game that was That's really great. popular and great. And I think the second game can be great as well and still just not connect, right? You're yeah. at a time and place. You know, the idea that Thomas was alone... I'm still not entirely sure why Thomas was alone worked. Yeah. You know, I think that's another thing is that um, we kind of... We mythologize our own lives a little bit and come up with... I was reading, uh, I was reading a book on the history of drones in the military for some wow. reason <laughs> i read a lot of weird books okay that's great um, but i was reading a Making book a note on my notes. and they were it's a really good actually I'll, I'll recommend it to you later yeah. the, the the drone book um but it's um specifically there's a um there's a there's a there's a there's a desire within humanity to tell good stories and, and one of the ways that manifests is that we often simplify history we remove all of the mess from the history complexity. we add causality we add good narrative beats uh, <laughs> that's when we're thinking about history which is why everyone knows you know certain points in history and everyone knows specific battles that turn the tide of a war. They didn't. They were a part of a yeah. sequence of events or whatever. Um, and I think we do that with projects. We kind of rationalize after the fact, oh, Thomas Was Alone was a hit because I'm a genius <laughs> and I made a series of really good choices. Um, but in, Also handsome, also incredibly, incredibly humble. I was very kind of you to say <laughs> that. I mean, obviously... I have a I have a face for podcasting, um, but the uh, but like no, it's uh, it's you do that after the fact, and I think you can kind of fall into that trap, and 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 you know Thomas Malone just I think it was right place, right time. You know, was yeah. a, I don't think anyone could have predicted that a, a game about rectangles um, with a voiceover by a guy who hosted a daytime TV show in the UK would actually do <laughs> kind of do what Thomas Malone did and be as well received as it was. So I think that's another thing is I think developers often don't know why our games are good. Yeah. And that makes reproduction of that kind of difficult. And it does. You know, that's, it's very interesting actually, because I think, um, one of the things I wanted to ask was, you know, it, it was about that feeling of like not knowing. So it was a similar with Journey. I had no expectations and it did really well and that was great. Mm. But then afterwards, you know, when Martin and I were talking about, well, what do you make? Like, I mean, I, actually, let's just do something totally orthogonal to what we mm. just did, right? Because you know that the chances of it being a breakout are, yeah. Yeah, I minimal think at best. Well, I mean, and you know, Journey. Obviously, there's you know lots of that, that game company. You know, you, you guys did a series of very successful games. Not to knock that, but uh, yeah, those are those something as massively, profoundly important as Journey. Yeah, that's a that's not something we can. You can't. My my thing I always say is like. You know, nobody, no artist in history has ever had just hit after hit after hit, yeah. except David Bowie, <laughs> who didn't because the '90s happened and he was, yeah. you know, he, he had a dip as well. Everyone, every, no one, no one achieves that kind of on, you know, everlasting. You look at any IMDb page for any filmmaker or like, you know, you, there are ups and downs. Fortunately, my valleys have been relatively. I've not had an absolute horrible experience yet. Yeah, um, probably will though at some point. Um, but yeah, so I think just being realistic about that is something I try and say to, to, especially when I meet like young devs who've just had like a big breakout hit. Yeah. It's like, it's okay. <laughs> it's, you, you know, the, what you're experiencing right now, enjoy it, experience yes. it, be here for it. Um, but also, you know, just get, get to work on the next thing when get you're comfortable and learn from this. Yeah. yeah. So what did you learn in making volume? What was some of the, what were some of the things that you learned? Cause I mean, obviously, you know, you're starting a thing, you're not, you're mm -hmm. doing your own thing. It's like, you got people that you're working with and like, you know, how does that, 
how did that, what, what did you learn what in that time? Learn? You know, because it, it's always rough, right? That, that's, mm. a, that's a rough process, even if you haven't had a success before. Yeah. So like, what are some of the lessons that you got from it? And they could be design lessons or they could really be anything. But. I think, I think the biggest one for me was giving up control. And Ooh. that was, yeah, cause I, cause I'd worked on, um, you know, I'd worked on other games and I'd worked my way up from like, you know, junior designer in charge of placing crates on level three, <laughs> right up to, I was, I ended up being like a design manager on my last couple of games. Um, and going through that whole kind of process. Um, and, and the, the big push for Thomas was Lone was, I want to make something that's mine. You yeah. know, I want to make something that's very personal. Um, and that's why Thomas was Lone was only made by me, a composer and a voice actor. Like it was yeah. a very, very personal project. Intimate. Very intimate. Um, and when I decided the next project I wanted to do was going to be more of, yeah, something like, you know, Metal Gear Solid, something a bit more impersonal, a bit more kind of, uh, I guess, mainstream, but like, you know, not an art piece. Um, I, I hadn't, I didn't let go of that desire to own everything. Yeah. Um, I, and, and I don't think it came from ego. I think it came more from, um, selfishness. Well, <laughs> I just, it I might wanted just to, come from experience, you know, I mean, yeah. that was your experience. And so you were like, well, I guess so I, was, I should I do, do what I'm good again. at. <laughs> and, and, and for that reason, you know, volume at the start was like, you know, I was coding it on my own. I was designing it on my own. I knew I needed more art beyond rectangles. So I needed to bring <laughs> some artists. Um, but I was still very much like the center of the universe with it and kind of coding and designing it, writing it, doing all that stuff. Um, and as the project went on, I, I gave less, I, I did give up some parts of that. You know, other coders came in because I, I couldn't do, we had um, uh, user generated maps and stuff. So I had to get server guys to know that. Yeah. And I had to get other people. I had level designers come in. So I, I slowly gave up bits of it but I still had to own and control everything. And I was, I was very neurotic with it. And, and I think, you know, I, I was, I like to think I treated people well, but I was also kind of, I was driving that process myself and putting a lot of personal pressure on myself. And it's been really interesting coming off of that and realizing those flaws uh, in my processes and how we, and what we've done is with the projects after that, you know, I don't code my own games anymore. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I, I have much better people who do most of the jobs that I used to do. The only thing that I do in kind of isolation now is writing. Writing's the only thing that I do, which is just me. Yeah. And, and even then, the script for our next game is was I put that on the Slack uh, uh, like three days ago, oh, and wow. now the entire team has filled my inbox with notes with and notes. feedback, which yeah. is great. So <laughs> even though even the thing that I do kind of hold to is that kind of I'm the auteur, I'm going to write this. This is my thing. Even that has become a group experience. But but everything else, you know, it becomes more a case of I've learned what a director is basically, and that was the big thing for me was just learning that directors don't hold the camera, that the and that they shouldn't because that's a terrible use of their time. There's better <laughs> people who can hold the camera. Um, it's better for them to be a, a useful. Um, uh, it's it's uh, curation almost. It's kind of pulling all that stuff together, and that was a, that was a that was a learning experience that happened on volume, and then yeah, subsequently kind of other games learned from it. On a game design level, um, it was uh, the big lesson was was test your games properly. That's um, a good one to learn, and specifically with play testing. So with volume, I play tested the game, and because I knew I was going for a more mainstream audience, I play tested it exclusively with less skilled players. So I was like, I'm gonna make I'm gonna make the stealth game that opens up the game to an audience and cool. people who've not seen volume. It's it's Metal Gear Solid VR missions basically. I, th I think that comparison's <laughs> been made by others. Um, so I, I was like, I'm gonna make this and I'm gonna make this for everyone. So I play tested it with kind of a more casual gamers, gamers who you know people who held a controller in their hands before, but maybe weren't stealth fans or yeah. weren't as aware. Um, and I never tested it with hardcore gamers. So we launched the game, and within five minutes, we realized... Well, no, no. before we launched the game, sent out review keys, and a couple of reviewers emailed me saying, Mike, am I meant to be able just to kind of skip all the combat in the game, all, all the all the stealth yeah. sections of the game and get to the next checkpoint and just run through it? Like, they were speedrunning it, basically, but, yeah. but not speedrunning in a clever way, just literally just running literally towards the exit. Um, and I said... No, you're not. That's that's uh, so. So we managed to we started building the patch and the fix for it. Like yeah. while the reviewers were playing we're the game playing and giving us, I mean, we 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 actually have a good Metacritic for volume. We would have had a much better one if we got this patch <laughs> yeah. done. Um, uh, and then we launched the game. And we we actually launched the game about a week before that was ready. And 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 the version that's out there now. Anyone who goes and plays volume now, they won't know what we're talking about. But that first version of the game was just you could speed run the whole thing. It was soft. 
was really soft and it was because we never play tested it with that with that audience and and i think that was the that was the moment i realized that focusing on one audience doesn't mean you ignore the others that was yes. the, the kind of the lesson there so now we test with a much broader range of players anyone who's built a vr title that's casual <laughs> <laughs> will have a similar experience not like i'm talking about myself but <laughs> i definitely think there's a point where you go oh i really want this thing to be accessible and then you really have to ask yourself who's going to buy this thing like who's mm. actually who's the front line and the front line is always the core gamer, right? Yeah, and that's, so you yeah. need to you need to dictate your decisions have to be about understanding what they are going to need in order to see their way to your point. And yeah, and not, they're going to go out just and like beat them over the head. Yeah, with it. then they're going to go. And if they sense that maybe it's a game that is in the same way all of us do, who are kind of core gamers, if they sense something's accessible and they think, oh my my friend who doesn't play games might like this, they'll then share it for you. Um, but yeah, the, the first couple of weeks on volume were tough because just watching watching a mistake playing out. And it's that thing, especially with um, with Volume, we tried to do the simultaneous console launch as well. Oh, geez. So while we could update it on Steam very quickly, we yeah, were you know, waiting for start. that uh, and everything like that. And and just knowing knowing that people's first experience is bad in a really repeatable way. Um, you know, I, I if, if, if everyone hates one of my games for multitude of different reasons, fine like that's okay <laughs> but when it's when you know everyone's hitting that same wall um and, and you know it, it's fine we fixed it in the end and and it's not i don't think it's part of kind of people's memory of the game but you know but that, you was, a no, <laughs> that was a lesson learned that, those are both really great points and i that that idea that like it's special because both those points that you made are things that a lot of people have to learn the hard way mm. um but there are also things that that come from this sense of shoulda, coulda, woulda, that you kind of have to get over, I think, in order to be really open as a designer. This mm. idea that there's a wall that people are hitting over and over and you could have removed it. There's um, there's a quality, I would say, to being a game designer that is about control and about understanding the universe and being the god of it, right? Mm. And one of the reasons that we do tend to get into these situations where we overwork or we fo overfocus on a particular idea to the exclusion of something else is because we have these brains that tell us that we can see everything and that yeah. we're really controlling it. And you have to get past that to be, I think, not just a successful business owner or um, to be a good boss, mm. but also to just be a designer who's open to letting things go. And like that idea of letting go um, at the end of Luna, that's actually the, the, my quote is let go because I had to learn the exact same thing in my, mm. my, in my next project. And so, you know, when, when you are working on something like that, um, obviously there's that point where you're wondering, is it going to be good? Like, <laughs> are people going to like it? Um, when did you realize that volume was ready? Like, when did um, you know that it was like ready to go? I, I looked at my bank account one day. <laughs> No, I mean that's 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 partially I've been there. true. I've yeah, been it's there. partially true. I've definitely um, been there. I, uh, so my my one of my biggest problems, um, and it's it's I think it's related to what you're saying. I think it's a different manifestation of what you're saying. Is I hate everything I make genuinely, and that's not false modesty. Like yeah. I genuinely, genuinely don't like my own work. Um, I usually about three or four years after I've made something, I look at it and I realize it's good. Yeah, I have the same problem. Yeah, it happened. To, I remember I had to record some footage for a Unity event of Thomas was alone because it was a very early Unity game, and that meant I had to play it for half an hour recording footage. And I laughed at a joke in it, and I was like, "Oh, okay, <laughs> that was that was good." Because time had passed and I'd forgotten it, and it was, "Oh, that's that's actually I see. Yeah, it's kind of charming. I can see how this works." Um, <laughs> So, and I, similar with volume recently, just kind of had to play that for something and, and, and actually I'm starting to like volume. Um, so, so that's actually an instinct I always have to fight is that nothing's ever good enough. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a problem with my own work. It's a real problem with working with other people yes, because obviously is. I can't let that negativity affect my team. Um, so I'm, I'm very careful with that. <laughs> um, it's become a weird meme. It's a horrible thing, and I, I hope they're making. I, I, think, <laughs> I think it's in jest, but my team there's a weird meme of like Mike says this isn't shit, um, and that's like the highest form of praise uh, that, that's possible, which I need to work on a little bit. Um, so yeah, so for me that nothing's ever done, and that's not just me saying that in the kind of the you know the stereotypical kind of work isn't 
art isn't finished, yeah. it's abandoned, you know. Yeah. I, I actually believe that. I actually hate my stuff, so therefore I always have to just kind of... I, I generally rely on other people to tell me. I generally... Um, that's that's why playtesting is important. But then beyond playtesting, just kind of having... I've surrounded myself with a lot of people who say no to me and yeah. disagree with me. Um, that's something intentional. Um, so I I generally listen. You know, there's with, with volume... Um, it was at a point where it was kind of getting near to polished. It needed some more work, but like showing that to people and, you know, my business partner, Alexander, who's, who's very much the adult, <laughs> uh, a, you know, points out the bank balance, but also said, Mike, I promise you, this is an eight out of 10 game. I promise you the yeah. Metacritic will hit and it's going to be an eight out of 10 at least. I think it was like 83 or something. Yeah. He was like, it's good enough. It's good enough. You, you, you let can it let it go now. Um, because otherwise I would be one of those developers who's working on something for 10 years. Like I, I know that that's my instinct. So I'm constantly fighting it. That's one of the reasons we made the shorts was to kind of, I wanted to challenge, like, can I make something in four months? Um, so yeah, so that's generally it, is I, 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 I try and force a, a ship day. Yeah. Either by asking people for their feedback or, you know, with the current project, you know, we have a, we have to have, we have a gold date set in stone and I know I can't move it. Yeah. And, and that's for the best for me. That's going to yeah. keep me in check. Cause yeah, my instinct is always, how can I get an extra six months on this? How can I get an extra year <laughs> on this? Um, so I'm, I'm the other way. I'm do very you, strict with myself. Do you raise the money yourself or does your partner do that for you? Um, we both do it. I, I, um, in terms of raising money for stuff, we've been very lucky that our games have, have kind of done quite a bit of money in the past for us so we have we have a nice uh, amount of war chest we can we can dip into um generally um we, we and because we have a good reputation we, we we're able to pitch comfortably and but yeah he does the he does the business organization budgeting handling organizing meetings but generally like when we're pitching or discussing with other people it's, it's me in the room because because yeah. i'm 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 the guy who's excited about it. And I'm also the guy who knows not to run into that corner of the room because the crane will crash, you know. So I, I, I kind of, I've got the... So no, generally I'm the pitch guy. And, I, and that was actually a job I did. One of my first jobs I was fired within three months was... Wow. Um, so my first job in the games industry was I was hired by a uh, pitching team at a big studio um, and I managed to upset everyone I worked with within three months. Wow. So yeah, so I was, I was, how old was I? I was 21. Okay. Um, I just graduated university um, and I didn't, I didn't really know anything or anyone. I'd made one flash game on my course. It was a video game degree. One of the first in the UK. And uh, showed up and I, I guess I impressed in the interview and got the job. But my, I was just a nightmare to work with. I was basically, <laughs> and it's something, I think it's something a lot of like recent graduates, um, you know, you've been an audience member for so long, you've been, you know, arguing about why game XYZ is shit on a forum for your entire childhood yes. and you show up to a company and you think that's how you're meant to talk. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I thought I was going to save the games industry and everyone who was two years older than me was. I'm uh, laughing idiot. because I was the same person when I got out of grad school. So yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm empathizing with it's, you. It's such an interest and, and yeah. working, you know, working with kind of um, working with juniors now as a studio owner, when I'm bringing in new, new talent and going, Oh no, this was me. This was, this was how I, this is, this is, this is what I was doing. <laughs> and having, to kind of say to people it's okay like it's you know because because in that environment i definitely was told to shut up and yeah. i don't want to do that i want to kind of let people express themselves but yeah. in a way that's that's productive <laughs> um but yeah it was uh, so yeah three months i got i didn't get fired i got um moved to the third floor of the building <laughs> onto the least important game were they were making in the timeout corner i was put in the timeout <laughs> corner for a couple of years i ended up back on that team later fortunately but yeah it was um it was a learning experience. Um, <laughs> it's funny now talking to, I'll occasionally run into kind of, um, well, actually, no, I, I, quite often I run into the guy who fired me, um, who's now a, an educator. So just talking to him about like his process and like kind of his curse of having to essentially work now with, you know, 50 of me yeah. <laughs> at, at that age for, uh, at the time. So yeah, uh, it's cool. But yeah, it was a, it was a learning experience. It was, that was definitely the... I feel like I'm talking a lot about uh, stripping away my ego. That seems to be a theme of the, uh, well, of the conversation. Is, it's funny because I was thinking about this. So I also teach. I teach in a program at UC Santa Cruz. And I, I founded the program after I moved to San Francisco mm. to build to build developers in a way that was kinder and gentler. And, and to build mm. not just developers, game developers, but actually people that um, can do creative problem solving together. Because I think that's how we're going to save the planet. So yeah, I was thinking about that and I was thinking about this idea of guide rails. You know, you need to put 
guide rails in place for young people. Um, mm -hmm. We have to do it at the studio, and I have to do it in the program. And you also want them to, to be motivated by their own power, right? So if yeah. they have the power of the critic, which is often what game designers have. And the energy have, as well. You yeah, know? It's like yeah. They, it's like their, it's their little engine that's pop, 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 pop. And you don't want to turn it off, and you don't want to like say shut up and turn, yeah. turn, turn them away from their own creativity or expression. Mm -hmm. But what you do want to do is say, perhaps it'd be more constructive if you said it like this, or have you mm -hmm. thought about the way that this would be heard. So, um, do you have any, um, sort of techniques that you use like now that you've developed as being, yeah, well, being can, empathetic with yourself? Right? I say, yeah. Cause essentially I'm directing young me. That's, that's generally kind of how I try and think of, yeah, the advice I give my young self. Um, yeah. I mean the, the biggest one is, 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 is to, um, identify, I think the, the big one that I, I notice really improves communication is identifying the problem being solved and the solution separately. Mm. So I think so often people, you know, will walk into a room and go, the car should be red. <laughs> um, and, and what they're actually saying is blue is a terrible color for the car. It's not working. I would like to propose a solution, the color red. And that's a conversation starter. That 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 there'll be people who disagree. There'll be people in the room who think blue was a great color. Yeah, it's, I think it's working fine. It's working fine. And there'll be other people who agree that blue is the wrong color, but they're thinking more in a green direction. Um, so uh, so yeah. So I think that's that's the biggest one is just encouraging people to break up their thinking a little bit in that way in terms of presenting an idea because it's very easy to to walk into a room and say. Um, you know, a very specific and absolute statement of, of fact about something when actually there's kind of a bunch of steps. And I think the other problem is the opposite, is walking into a room and saying, blue's a terrible color for a car <laughs> and, and, not, and not presenting an idea of a solution for that. Um, I think that's an issue. And I think finally, the final issue uh, is walking into a room and saying, I don't think something's wrong with the car and not identifying it. So I think yeah. it's always about just having all the parts of the process. So something's wrong, what's wrong, and an idea of what you think might solve it. And, yeah. and that's that's the that's the kind of the pattern I try and kind of uh, express to, to younger devs is just uh, that that's starts a conversation. And then just honestly, basic manners, right? Like showing respect. I, and I work, my team's great. Like I, I've not had to deal with anything like that. But definitely in, earlier in my career, I've encountered people who are just obnoxious like yeah. that's that is a thing that happens you know um and sometimes that's sometimes that's a case of just they don't know sometimes if someone's not been challenged on a certain behavior they don't realize you know i'm sure we all have flaws that we've been unchallenged on um and and therefore we could we could all be better but there are definitely you know early in your career you may have not yeah. cleaned up some of those edges should we say or worse you may have you may have been working alone or yeah. working in isolation and mm. had all these thoughts in your head and never had to express them to anyone else and then when you're working with someone else yeah. they come out i think what's really interesting about that idea is that there there are basically conversational tools that you can have as a as a designer or as a programmer or as an artist or as a sound designer or producer or even as as the person raising the money there are conversational tools that you can have and every time you change context you have to kind of reset and ask yourself what are the conversational tools that are appropriate yeah. for this environment you know there are there are books like um getting to yes or nonviolent communication um uh difficult conversations there are a lot of books that i give my students that i'm like hey if you're having this problem on your team it's because you're not listening but there yeah. are also just some really good basic stories there's a there's an article on Google's process for this thing they called Project Aristotle, where they were trying to come up with the best creative team. What mm. is the, you know, they're kind of engineer. What <laughs> Solving is the, that problem. What is yeah. the best creative team? And what they found was that um, the best creative teams are teams where people can walk into the room, mm. have a few laughs, set, settle down, look at the problem honestly, have that kind of conversation. And then before they leave, yeah, you know, it's a little bit more of that same freedom. It mm. means that people can get into a groove when they go into the room because it's safe to say something controversial or different. And also people don't take it too seriously. Like the Absolutely. idea that like, it's not, it's not rocket science. No one's going to die. If the car is blue is something that I think a lot of people don't, they don't start from there. Yeah. And I think as well, that comes, I think it's also a massive amount of the responsibility also goes to the, the leader in this situation for setting that tone. Um, you know, I've definitely had conversations where, well, a, 
the car's been blue for a while <laughs> and uh, you know younger members of the team have been like that car really shouldn't be blue this isn't working <laughs> um and then haven't said anything and that's not their fault that's because i've not like you know i've not made it clear to them that they can so i've had that situation where someone's kind of privately kind of taken me to one side and said mike i feel like maybe the blue isn't right it's like <laughs> no that's cool that's i agree yeah. with you let's cool, go and cool. fix let's that. change it yeah and i think the other one that's a, a more nuanced one which is which is really interesting is where um the car's blue and the car um and then someone feels that the car shouldn't be blue um, and assumes a lack of intent. I've definitely come across this yeah. where 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 people assume people don't because because obviously it's impossible for everyone on a team to be in every conversation. So it's it is the responsibility of leaders often to um, to communicate not necessarily all of the thinking that's led up to a point. And I know I can be lazy and say the car's blue. Okay. Just, <laughs> Can we just move on? The car is blue. We've, we, <laughs> I don't want to argue with you about this. Anymore. The car is blue. It's like, okay. trust me, I, I agree with you. I love red as well. We thought reasons. about it. There are yeah. reasons. Please, can we move yeah, on? Can we and, and and the problem is, even if even if that is 100% accurate, and if you were to explain to that person, be like, oh, yeah, no, it should be blue, um, you've still done them a disservice by behaving in that way because yeah. they're... They they're gonna they're gonna you know they're gonna assume well maybe maybe this is, maybe there is no reason maybe this guy is just being yes ob ob obtuse or maybe they don't know I think that's the other thing that like especially with programmers sometimes if you try to explain to them hey like there's a reason that the bloom has to look this way or there's a reason that these shapes are in the distance and mm -hmm. like I know it's a pain to render it or it's screwing up the frame rate and I I, I know you want to change the fill on this frame but like if we change it, then these other things happen. And mm. it's important to do that work because it builds respect for the and artist was, or the sound designer, whatever the problem is, right? You need yeah. to, you need to translate the need across the barrier of implementation sometimes. Yeah. And beyond yourself as well. It's one of the biggest lessons I ever learned. And I, it's, it was a terrible experience. It's a very terrible part of my career, but, but one that I think it was really important to my personal growth was years ago working in Facebook games, back when Facebook games were the future. I remember that. Yeah, then it was mobile, then it was VR, now yeah. it's blockchain. But, yeah. but yeah. back when back when Facebook <laughs> games were, were everything, um, <laughs> it's unfair and dismissive so, of all some work being done. It's, it's true, um, though. It's so true. There's but, always something. Yeah, there's always something. Um, so I was working in Facebook games, and I joined a company as their design lead. Um, very early on in the company, you know, basically it was just the founders and, and myself. And... Um, and and they, you know, hired a bunch of people, a uh, bunch of programmers. But they were hiring web developers because web developers were the people who knew Flash and knew the tool. Um, and the idea was, Mike, you're going to bring game design to this. Um, and what I didn't realize <laughs> <laughs> was that in the world of web design, there is UX, there is design. Design, though, is how it looks. There's yeah. no concept of a game designer. Yeah, of or interaction design. Of that kind of, all of the stuff that like is under that banner and, and, and what's, a, what's level design. We just make a chair, we make a room, don't we? No, no, there's, 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 there's process and history behind that. Um, so I, I ended up having to, over the course of two years, kind of... Um, kind of be the not only be the designer on the team but also be the guy trying to prove the case for that we should have designers as a concept like it was a it was it was like a courtroom drama it was kind of, I, was, <laughs> I was lobbying for, for, for I game object <laughs> and but that was it really put me on the back foot and I think as well because I was a bit younger I was a bit like I shouldn't have to explain this it's obvious um so it was it was a really interesting process of yeah and I would I would we'd 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 I'd have a conversation with a coder about kind of how I remember you know you'd click around and the character would move and obviously you know the feel of that and how quick that should be and what the wind up time on that should be and all, all, all of the, the many variables one can change about an, an object moving in a linear fashion from one point to another that, yeah. that are really important um and we'd have a conversation. I'd be like, I think that's the right. And he'd argue something. I'd be like, that's really interesting. Yeah, we should. Do. And we'd have what I was, you know, doing as a design process. And then I'd go away and I'd come back the next day. And that character now jumped everywhere rather than walking anywhere. It's like, what, what was Whoa. that? He's like, no, I took your suggestions on board. I'm like, no, no, we had a design conversation. Yeah, we, <laughs> like, we actually was, had a spec. <laughs> yeah, so it, so there was a, there was a bit of that, and that was a challenge. And and but I think actually was very humbling for me, and kind of uh, kind of had to fight my corner a little bit, which was fun. Um, not always fun. Um, no, no, no. But no. but yeah, so it was. So I think I think that's the other aspect here is, and it, obviously in a game in a kind of a mature game development team, that's not an issue. Like yeah. the people understand. Uh, what a designer is. Which is why it's paradise. I mean, it's really paradise to get a great mm. team together for that yeah. reason, right? I mean, that's why we all want it. Yeah, and, and creating that team where everyone has their voice, everyone's listened to. We also, um, and I'm sure this is true of a lot of things you've worked on, the kind of the smaller teams, like, 
you've all got to work outside of your own discipline, right? Everyone's got to have, everyone's got to be pulling three or four different jobs in, um, and and it has to feel like they're welcome in conversations which they are unqualified for. Yeah. You know, it's and that, and getting that balance right, and having you know, it's okay to be interested in how you know. I, you know, you might not be able to make the car, but you can have an opinion on the car, you know, yes. and that kind of thing has been getting that right is, is important. So when you decided to move to these smaller games, did mm. you do that because it made it easier to do this kind of guide rails in the process? Like what was there a connection? Do you think between, um, between how you run the studio and then like doing the shorter things or like what was, where did that come from? So, I mean, so the smaller games actually kind of come from more of a, uh, I guess, a business perspective, but also just a situational one. Okay. Um, so we were, so we'd made, so we'd worked with Google on, we did a Daydream launch title. And it, it went well, it was fun, it was, um, we're proud of it, but, you know, we realized, ah, oh, we kind of, VR's cool, but there are, basically, honestly, I played job simulation, I was like, I'm never going to make anything as cool as that. Yeah, it's not my scene. Uh, well, I was like, I was just like, there are, everyone else is already two years ahead of me. I can't contribute to this, so I'll go over and you know do something else. Essentially, is for me, I always have to feel like I'm doing something original or pushing something yeah. forward. And with VR, it was just I've been outclassed by everyone. In it's a pretty middle. difficult place to design for. I think people are yeah. very dismissive of it, but it's I think oh, no, designing no. for VR is like doing game design all over again from the beginning, yeah. which is why it's best for young teams to do it, in my opinion. But, I agree. No, that makes yeah. sense. That makes sense. And and I think those. But I think what's really interesting is some of those really young teams are now like mature geniuses in the field. So I, I was looking at that and I was just like, this isn't. This isn't. Uh, it's not. It's not something I can add to. There are other areas of game development where I can probably. Yeah, in other other niches I can kind of do interesting yeah. stuff in. Um, so after that, we. Uh, I had an idea for a mechanic that was uh, just a way of playing that I've really wanted to do in a game for years. Um, which I'm not going to say because we'll make it one day. Okay. But we uh, <laughs> we were we so we, we made a prototype of that and we we took it to to Dice and GDC and we were pitching it to every publisher. Um, and we got a lot of interest. Um, and there were kind of two publishers who were vying for it. It was all very exciting. Juicy. Very cool. Um, and then one of them kind of you know did things a little bit faster than the other one. So it's like okay, you're publishing you it. it. Let's do this. Um, and then. Just as the contract was being reached forward, uh, entire change of management at the top of the publisher. Oh, no. Which, for those who are listening who don't know, when that happens, they kill everything because yeah, no one can everything. take credit for anything. That's so, right. So we were, we were unfortunately immediately kind of severed. I'd started building the team around this game and built, and getting this set up. I've had this experience, so yeah. I'm, I know what it feels like. So it was so we were we were kind of like, well, do we do we want to polish up the prototype some more and take it round for? And I, and I didn't want to be spending two years pitching the same game. I've seen that. That's a trap you can fall into very easily. Yeah. Um, so uh, I pitched Alexander. I, I said to him like, how much money can we can we waste on something? And he was like, I, I you know you can spend this much, and it wasn't much. Um, and I was like. Okay, I can. I that's enough for me to keep this team together for like six months or four months, five months, six months. Can we? Can I make something stupid and small? Yeah. Um, and that's that was my pitch to him for Subsurface Circular. And I was like, well, we we've got we've got some good artists. We've got this uh, coder friend of mine, a guy called Mu Yu, who's making Nights and Bikes with Rex right now. Um, which is amazing. Which is amazing. But he was, they were in a period where they were doing, they were focusing much more on the art. So he kind of had a couple of days free a week. So he was available and we, we, we live near each other so and we're friends. So, together. Was like, so I was like, I'll grab him and yeah. he can do some code. The and hustle. Like, <laughs> the hustle, exactly. I can keep this art team kind of here. Yeah. Um, so it's like, what can we make that's art heavy with no code? Um, like a walking simulator style game, something like that. And then it, da it dawned on me, no, I can write, I can write, and I'm, I've got nothing to do. So <laughs> I can, I, so we, we just, we realized like, let's tell, let's do a, like this story visual novel kind of thing, but let's do something which is more kind of in my interests, which is more kind of, let's do an Asimov short story. Let's do something completely out there. And it worked, but it, but most importantly, the main purpose that project happened was to keep that to keep team, it, around. team together. Um, and then we shipped that and it did really well. Um, in the meantime, we'd started conversations about like the next big thing we were going to do. Um, and that was going really well and it's very exciting, but the, you know, I realized from my, from my lawyers, like yeah. it's going to take about six months, Mike, for you to be yes. able to start this. It's like, okay, let's make another short yeah. game. <laughs> so, so, sorry, I, I yes. lost on podcast by started rubbing my face there. So no, I'm like, okay, let's do another, let's do another one. So that's where Quarantine Circular came from was to fill that other gap. This is such a, it's such a hard thing to explain to people who haven't run a business who aren't designers um, because it's, 
there's this feeling, right, that you have when you know you want to make something. Like, mm. I'm sure for your next thing that you want to make, and like, I have it for mine, and yep. I'm pitching it right now. Um, so if you want to give either of us lots of money, please do. Um, <laughs> but uh, but when you have this idea, and you've been thinking about it, and you're getting it into a pitchable state, and then you do a few pitches, you start to feel like, oh my God, yeah, I can see it. And then you feel this, like, it's almost like lust, or like, Ugh. like it's like you feel sick like you you can't stop thinking about them mm-hmm. <laughs> and then like you want the that you just want them near you and you want to see <laughs> them and it, it, it ends up becoming this thing where you're like talking about it to a publisher and you start to fall in love with it yeah and they can see it but it's so painful when you end the meeting and you're like oh no i can't talk about it anymore i gotta i hope somebody gives me money to make this yeah. right like and then when you get to the, a situation like this where you're like well there's definitely going to be a six month window where I'm doing this, and I definitely have to keep these people together because they're my and people. And distract myself as well because exactly, I'm, 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 I'm deep in lust, as yes, you say. Exactly. Like I'm excited for that project, but I know <laughs> I can't. I can't see them for six months, so yeah, I so need to do something. I've yeah. got to start rowing. So you know, you yeah. put everybody in the boat and you start rowing, and like, how do you motivate yourself in that time? Like, because I I feel this all the time right now. I'm doing it right now, mm. and it's such a. Um, it's such a hard thing to describe to someone who hasn't had it. Like, wh- what is it? What is your? How do you get up in the morning and and and, and not look at your phone and check in on their check in on, on, on their the Instagram? Email. No, I mean like you know uh, how yeah, do you yeah, not yeah. how do you not like keep attached to the? To I have the, to stay busy. I'm, I'm worried about this metaphor because I think it's gonna it's very it's dangerous territory. But I I do something else. Yeah, do for something a bit. else. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, that's that's yeah. So I I am. Um, I, I find other other projects and, and that's where a lot of these kind of like the Google thing grew out of because yeah. I had a, a bit of time. So I was like, I'll make a little mobile thing. And then Google liked that and wanted that in VR. So we, we, we ended up doing that. But like, yeah, so with subsurface and quarantine, they are they they're 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 the summer flings you know they're the, yeah. they're the, well, the and side things do you so this is another question that is just totally coming from this conversation yeah. but like do you so for me the summer flings i've been organizing them now for from has been in business for about six years and so we've had several flings um and two affairs and we're getting ready for a big one now and i try to organize them so they teach me something mm-hmm. about the big thing like i'm trying to date yeah. So that I can I can be committed, yeah. you know. You're trying to learn. I'm just trying to learn yeah. the relationships, you know. Like, so so were there little nuggets? In oh, these certainly. Games? Yeah. What, what I were mean, those? Were they writing? Or? So the writing was the big one. So the big the biggest kind of gap because uh, so I'm not a writer. I have no history with writing. But uh, Thomas was alone because it was so small and because it was very personal. It was like no one else was going to do it. So I I wrote it. I bought like you know those awful hack books you see of, like, <laughs> how to write a screenplay in sixty yeah. minutes. Those kind yeah. of books. There I are bought, only seventeen plots. Yeah, exactly. I bought all those books and read them cover to cover and hated them but actually the one it's uh, with thomas was alone the one thing where i broke the kind of the story structure hollywood thing that was the one point that every review commented like the story kind of flags a bit at that point it's like that's the one bit i tried to be original on so yes all the books are true annoyingly um <laughs> but yeah so i so I, I kind of crash coursed myself and got got to a point where i could write something and then because thomas was alone was so well received for its story i thought i you know i thought it was a game rather than a story i was very much proud of the level design but no one cared about the level design yeah. turns out i'm a writer so i um so with volume i kind of kept writing but the but the, the biggest thing that's always bothered me about the writing i've done in my games is it's very um linear and just basically you're playing a game while a radio drama happens over here and yeah, so subsurface and quarantine were both experiments in nonlinear, yeah, kind of branching narrative, um, taking kind of conversation systems and doing them in a way that was less gamey. Cool. Um, and subsurface, subsurface achieves it quite well. Subsurface feels like natural conversation, which is really cool. Quarantine, I think, less so because we pushed up the ambition of lots of characters. Um, and I think that made it feel a bit more video gamey. So you found like a breaking point there. I think there, there. Well, I think I found a. I think I found a path into the dark woods, and I need to turn back. And <laughs> yeah. you know, if 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 I find myself with six months free again, then you I'll probably play with something else. But like, find try and find a different route through that through that forest. But the um, but yeah. So I I I definitely the narrative stuff. Um, but yes, I think as well, it was a really good uh, learning process for me in terms of managing a team um, to work on something efficiently and quickly. Like, you yeah. know, subsurface took four months. Get some and, skills. And you have to, like, you can't leave anything to chance when you're making nope. a game in four months. And I mean, subsurface is a small game, you know, yeah, it's yeah, not, yeah. It's, it's definitely not, a, you know, an, an epic, but. Um, just getting that thing shipped was, was, you know, that was a learning experience. And, and these processes come in. And what was really exciting about it was 
and this has extended into the project we're doing at the moment, was because I basically formalized my process. Before that, I was just, I was basically a lone dev who was spending half my day emailing other people to give me stuff for my game. That was very much how I was approaching it. That's how volume was made. Volume was made by me making my game and getting other people to give me stuff yeah. for my game. And it was very centralized on me. It's like you were a chef. Yeah, and it was it was not good. It, well, a, a, it wasn't a healthy process. Everybody knows that chefs are live the hardest lives. <laughs> I was going to say something <laughs> was, else, but <laughs> yeah, 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 it was it was it was tough, and it was and it was foolish, and it wasn't the best way to make a video game. Um, but by having to make these games very quickly, you know, I had to go. No, we're going to have we're going to have stand up meetings. I don't like I don't like a lot of kind of scrum methodology. I think a lot of these kind of management systems exist mainly to make managers feel useful and important. I don't, think, <laughs> I don't think they're always useful, but we definitely have taken things like, you know, we have a daily meeting, a yeah, daily call, which is happening right now. I'm not there for oh. it. Um, that's all right. I, this is fun too. Um, <laughs> like, uh, so, so like we, we do the daily meetings, we have, you know, scheduling software, we have all of that process. And the only reason we did that was because we had to make something so quickly. Yeah. But what's the, the side effect of that I'd never considered was it actually meant that for this new project, I've been able to hire much less experienced younger people people because there's now a structure for them yeah on like everyone on volume had at least five or six years of industry experience working at big companies it was made by a bunch of people i'd met through my career yeah. um and and that's cool but also you know i wanted to have a more interesting team diversify yeah, my diversity. team get more yeah. people in of, of for in diverse in a million different ways yeah um and and that meant uh you know going younger i wasn't kind of i wasn't in inheriting the the biases that had kind of led to who who had jobs at the big studios um and that's and and having that structure in place helps those uh new employees because they they're not scared of going wrong yeah the there's the, those are the guide rails that we talked about earlier it's the guide rails. i, I really, I really believe rails. that the guide rails are so important and that that this idea of diversity like when i said before that i think that vr should be made by a young team i didn't mean young in age i meant a team that was fresh mm. that's really looking at things from a fresh perspective and who's 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 a who's willing to do the research, but you definitely need the guide rails with that because otherwise there's so much uncertainty that people get depressed and anxious yeah. and they feel that they can't do it. And it's very important to, to, for creatives, right? It's so important to structure the environment so that they don't beat themselves up too much. I think so. Especially, I think it's, I think it's heightened when you have a big discrepancy in experience. Yeah. I think if, I think if you're all, if you're all, you know, new people with a fresh new team, making your thing, experimenting, seeing what happens, I almost feel like maybe you shouldn't structure too much. You're yeah. you're a you're a punk band. You should Find be, it out do, do what you're doing. Yeah. Um. But but in a team like mine, where, you know, we've got, I'm you know me and me and my my concept artists I've worked with for years. Um. We you know we're twelve years into our careers. Um. I'm very visible and public in a way that you know most of the people who work for us have heard of me before they yes. work for us. Yeah. That brings a bunch of baggage as well. Um. So there were, so when someone's, you know, when this is someone's first job and they're working with um, two guys who've been friends for 12 years yeah. and, and, and have been doing this forever and are referring to the good old days of the PlayStation 2, that's <laughs> terrifying and confusing <laughs> and, and is a lot of pressure. And, and you can very quickly, and I, I remember this from early in my career, you start inventing these narratives in your head of like, I, you know, Mike's pissed off at me. This, yeah. this has gone wrong, you know. Um, so yeah, anything you can do to kind of structure the greatest thing about, uh, like our, our structure right now is my the junior members of my team know that they're ahead of schedule. Yeah. I never did. When I joined the games industry, I was always <laughs> panicking and rushing to do stuff. And I had no idea because yeah, I, I guess cause they weren't to get more work out of me. They never told me what the schedule was. Jeez. Um, but now I can, you know, if a member of my team's like, Hey Mike, like, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to rush and get this, try and get this done by the end of the day. It's like, you don't have to, don't have it's to. not due till Monday. Yeah. Like don't, yeah. don't kill yourself yeah. over this. Yeah. And, go have and, a beer. <laughs> and that's, and, and there's a great, there's a great, um, that's liberating. And, and that's a side effect of scheduling that I didn't, I didn't see actually being an issue. So, um, so this idea of communication and all the ideas about guide, guide rails and all the things that we've talked about, mm. they're all, they're, they're very much about sort of the social aspect of making a product, right? Mm. Um, you are huge on Twitter. More than I'd like. Yes. You, you have a huge Twitter <laughs> following. Um, can you tell me why you do it? Because I know from yeah. talking to you now for this hour <laughs> that you you have a lot on your plate and you're you're trying to be creative, you're trying to yeah. structure this environment for this team and and people ask me all the time, Robin, why do you do X? Why do you mm. teach? Why do you do this? Why do that? Twitter is your thing that you do extra. 
kind yeah. of. Yeah. Why do you do it? Um, I think I think it definitely started to show off. I think if I'm being honest, I think as most people, you know, we all we all for the yucks. But for, for well, because we all we all you know we all join social media to kind of show off and boast about how lovely our lives are. I think it's a big part of it, or at least it was in the golden days. Yeah, of in the Twitter. golden days when it was mostly jokes. And, yeah, exactly. And fun I, like what? Well, yeah, like back in I can't remember when I joined Twitter. Like, but it was super early when it was just kind of. You followed five yeah. good nerdy comedians and, and then your friends. You and know. made Star Trek jokes. Exactly, yeah. yeah. I feel like every every platform starts with Star Trek jokes. <laughs> I remember Sev Trek on the internet. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> um, so that's dated me. Um, but like, yeah, so the um, so I, I think that's how I started on there. I think as time went on, um, and and that audience grew. Um, and it, you know, I'm not. I'm definitely not the biggest developer on Twitter, but you know, I do have an audience. Um, partially it's because I want my team to stay employed. I want to be able to sell my game. So okay, being visible, so you're building a marketing audience on the there, platform. That's definitely a part of it. Yeah. Um, I've <laughs> given the times we live in as well. I kind of also want to talk a little bit about some of the, some of the issues that bother me. Although I try not to, um, I try not to be too boring about that, I guess. But yeah, the, there's, there's definitely, there's a, I think, I think it's, it's a time where I feel I want to talk publicly. I think, I think we all have read history books and gone, why didn't more people say stuff? And you know, I it's think it's important. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a little aspect of that as well. But also I think still still for the fun of it as well. It's really nice um, to make dumb jokes about Spider Man on PS4. You know, it's, <laughs> it's fine to look and you see seeing people posting screenshots. <laughs> bringing it, bringing it and back to Ted Price. Selfies. <laughs> oh yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's like I do think Talking I, about puddles. Talking about puddles. I, do, I talked a lot about puddles. But I, I, I do try, and I think there is an opportunity to, to also... I think you can be positive and also be talking about some of the darker things going on in the world right now at the same time. Yeah. It's, and Twitter's kind of unique as a platform for that. But I fundamentally... I turned down... This actually happened this week. A company reached out to me saying, um, you know, can we send you... I'm clearly on one of these influencer lists. Because oh, I got... They were like, can you can we send you... A, I'm not going to say what it is, but a, pro, a quite a expensive product. product. Yeah. Um, a Tesla. Oh. <laughs> yeah, only if I smoke weed on. <laughs> um, but the, uh, but the, uh, they said, you know, can we send you a very expensive product? I was like, of course you can send me a very expensive product. That's absolutely fine. They were like, okay, well, we need you to make this video and do blah, this. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, 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 blah. And I was like, I'm going to be honest with you. Like, I'm a game developer who uses Twitter. I'm not going to promote your product. That's not, that's, that's not who I am. But fair play. Thank you for, for thinking of me. Um, Cheers. Thanks. And, but it's happened to me several times where I've taken a meeting and I've realized halfway through the meeting, oh, you're not talking to me as a game developer. You just want me to tweet your hashtag on a specific day. Um, so I tr whenever I get a sense of that, I tend to pull back because yeah. that's when I know I'm going a little too far and I don't want to, that's not who I am. That's not what yeah. I want to be doing. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's fun to talk about games with people and it still is. Um, uh, that's even now. Even now. And, and to be fair, obviously, I'm insulated from a lot of the horrible stuff. Yeah. By, by virtue of my, my birth. But um, it's, you know, I think, yeah, it's still, it's still, I still think it could turn around, but. Uh, Man, I hope so. It's unfortunately, it's owned by some people who don't yes. necessarily uh, share my views on this. There's a, yeah, I'm sure if they invent the right algorithm, it'll be absolutely fine, right? <laughs> That's, uh... So on that note, um, so what are you talking about while you're here? What am I talking about? I'm doing I'm doing roundtables about video game um, bundles and sales and all of this stuff because I don't think anyone's talking about that at the moment. I'm interested in just checking in on how it's going for people because, yeah, I remember when Humble Bundle was king and now no one's really talking about that stuff. Yeah. And then so we're doing we're doing some roundtables to kind of talk about that. And I just want to kind of gauge opinions from people about that. Um, and other than that, I'm not really doing anything. My next project's super secret for the time being, so I'm kind wow. of not plugging that. But Anyone who's listening who wants to buy any of my previous games. Yes, more please do. Thomas was alone, volume, subsurface, circular, quarantine, circular, earth shape on Google Daydream. Um, <laughs> yeah, feel free. <laughs> well, and the same is true for me. I'm obviously out here pitching a super secret next project, which hopefully will get funded very soon. Um, we're also uh, just getting ready to ship some really great stuff on the Magic Leap. So I'll be keynoting the Magic Leap conference coming up, oh, which is really great. Yeah. And then uh, we have Luna, which is out uh, on all VR platforms except PSVR. And with Tom, which will be coming out very soon <laughs> really really close now um which will be available both these games will be on the floor at, at tokyo game show so that, right, that's cool. where i'm headed next thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us it was an absolute it's pleasure really great yeah seriously cheers
Thank you for joining us for the Game Maker's Notebook. For more information on the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences, our podcasts, and our other initiatives, please visit www.interactive.org.